not the labels from the doctors or the names from the bullies or the pain in my body. None of it. Go beyond that. So when I was talking to these high schoolers and realizing they, they had very blank faces. <laughs> All of them looked like they were bored silly. <laughs> really could care less that I was there. But there was a group of hearing impaired kids. And I didn't know they were going to be there. I'd forgotten that they were part of the high school now. They are not mainstreamed. They just use the high school. So they come from Perth Amboy and Brunswick, and they come to this prestigious high school in this prestigious town, and all I could think was, wow, I am here for that. Because <laughs> I am sure they feel as marginalized as I did and they need to know that everyone here, even the ones in their cheerleading outfits, don't feel like they fit in. Because the world so easily puts a, a, stamp, a, a veil over us, and it's our job to lift it off and see what's really there. In sixth grade, I so wanted to be a cheerleader. <laughs> and I remember there were tryouts, and the other girls were practicing in gym, and I wouldn't dare try anything there, but I went home at night and tried to do a split, and tried to do a, a side stag, and <laughs> the different things they were learning. And it occurred to me, I never thought I could try out. It just wasn't even in my brain, because I felt so different from the cheerleader. But I could have been on the sidelines with them. I could have been the most enthusiastic, maybe not the most flexible. But I didn't even give myself the chance. And when I looked out on these high schoolers and wondered how many dreams do they squash every day, thinking, I, I can't do that. That's not who I am. And now, I'm my own cheerleader. I have to be. Because out in the world, people don't necessarily know who we are inside, but they judge by the outside. And I don't want to be defined that way anymore. Eleanor Roosevelt says, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Why weren't they teaching that when we were in high school? <laughs> I would have rather learned that than what FDR was doing. It wasn't applicable to my life. And I wonder, why are we teaching these facts and figures instead of this empowerment? How to find who you really are, who you were before the world started to label you, or your parents, or people who loved you, but still, they don't know. No one else knows why you're here except you. So we need the tools to go inside. And it seemed there was a common advice was, Use visualization, use affirmation. You know, dream of who you could be, not who you are right now, but who you could be. I don't think we give enough airtime to our dreams. We were taught in school, you know, don't daydream. Be serious, focus, work hard. I have these two lines, like, permanent. <laughs> From my, I was trying so hard to make up for what I thought were my shortcomings that I think I just shut down what my heart was saying, which was like, you know, chill out, you're okay. I think that pain is not the, same, the signal that something is real or true. It's the signal that we're not looking at it the way our soul would look at it. We're shutting down and saying, oh, that's the truth. If someone said something mean to me, I assumed it was real. I didn't think to myself, well, that hurts. I don't think that's true. I think it hurts because it isn't true. But we're kind of taught that our conscience will give us signals through pain. I think our conscience gives us signals through joy, through ease and peace, instead of, nope, don't do that, or nope, do it my way. But from the time we're small, we're told, you know, we're told who to listen to. We're not told to listen to ourselves. We're not even told, I think, that we might have the answers, not in a book, but through our life experience, through 
just being who we are, being comfortable with who we are. Remember the game, Pin the Tail on the Donkey? I hated that game. <laughs> I felt out of control enough. I didn't need a blindfold put on me and then spun around and pushed in the wrong direction. You know, as the other kids laughed. They thought it was fun. And I thought a couple weeks ago, I wondered, why didn't I think that was fun? And it seemed like a good metaphor for my life, for everyone. We, we stuff this spirit, this consciousness, this personality into this little vehicle. And the moment we get here, we have to worry about eating and, uh, and then taking care of it and taking it to the bathroom and make sure it doesn't smell or make sure it fits in make money so we can keep it safe. And all those distractions are just spinning us away from the whole target of the game was to have fun. To be here was an adventure. It's supposed to be a challenge, not the nose to the grindstone thing that I thought it was. That's just adding more pain. I think the pain in my joints got worse and worse the harder I tried. The harder I tried to fit in, the harder I tried to understand what other people wanted. It was just a further nightmare because life will mirror back what we carry around inside. And as I carried around my old stories and my sadness and these events with my other doctors and bullies, I couldn't let it go because I thought it was real. I thought it was who I was. And when I wrote, and finally started getting it out of me, it suddenly looked like fiction. Like, huh, that's what happened. And I took it really seriously. I thought it was I was ruined because my body was different. Or we go through a hard time and we think it's ruined because we're bad. Something awful must have gone on for us to have to go through this. Instead of thinking, hmm, I bet there's some incredible silver lining to this. I just have to look. Because our focus leads us where we need to go. You know, pin the tail on the donkey, or uh, what's that one, Marco Polo. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's more fun because of the challenge, because we're blindfolded. But we forget that the challenge is supposed to be uplifting. It's supposed to be like climbing a mountain instead of just taking a stroll. We could do both. But the mountain is really rewarding. You know, that's why we all watch the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And it's so exciting. It's people are pushing beyond their, their capacity. And that's what my body, which I thought would poison everything, has done for me. It stripped away the masks of who I thought I was supposed to be. It stripped away the pretenses that I put on as I grew up. You know, it's so great to see little kids. They have no pretense. They, and they enjoy their life so much. We could just take that into our adult life, that silliness, that, you know, just dance on a dime, just laugh. That's an incredibly healing thing. I have two little kids now to remind me of that. I'd forgotten for many years. I'd sort of gone into hibernation, thinking that the more serious and focused I am on my problems, the more I can solve them, instead of rising above and looking from a higher perspective, a joyful one, the way our soul would look at us and cheer and root for us and say, you're fantastic, you're beautiful, wonderful and not be concerned with the circumstances, with the body, with the, the hardship, because knowing that on the other side, if we choose to, we can find a blessing there. Always, every time. The arthritis in my shoulder, it was about 10 years ago, got so bad that I had to give up my art business. And my art had always been a really positive part of myself that I felt had given me value 
when I didn't feel a whole lot of value to offer the world. And so when I lost that ability, I was crushed. And I thought, this is it. This is the last straw. This time I won't be able to find that silver lining. What could be good about arthritis? I was so angry. And of course, as soon as that anger comes in, you shut down to all possibilities. It took a while. I remember my father saying, well, why don't you try, buy a computer and try, this was before we all had them, try computer graphics with your left hand on the keyboard. And I thought, well, I didn't want to give up my brush and pen, but maybe, maybe he had an idea there. So we got a computer, and before I could even start with the computer graphics, I got totally hooked on email. <laughs> and I started to write to my friends in the most honest way I ever had what was going on with me. And some of the, the events that had been so painful and hard to get past and hard to forget because I thought they were me. And as I told them, and they responded saying, you know, everyone has their scars. Yours happen to be visible, but we all have them. And in some ways, because mine were visible, I had to face them. I couldn't run anymore. I literally couldn't run. I, my hips were, were needed replacing too. So as I started to type, with my left hand, I started to feel better. Even my shoulder, it was not going into spasm every day. I was not having to use painkillers anymore. And I think it was about three weeks into this writing tirade, I walked into the kitchen and I said to my husband, I can't believe how many years I wasted selling myself short. And I went, oh, that sounds like the title of a book. <laughs> And it was going to be the title until I found another book that was called